Legendary Passages, Episode 2A, The Birth of Hercules, Tales of His Youth from Diodor Siculus, Library of History. Last time, the little Hercules strangled the snakes in his crib. This time, we review his origins and his life before his labors. After a long preamble about the unlikely life of this hero turned god, the author gives his lineage from Jupiter to Perseus, of Pegasus fame, to Electrio to Alcmenes, mother of Hercules. Jupiter disguised himself as Alcmenes' husband Amphitrio and fathered Heracles. This lineage made him more god than man, and the last and greatest mortal son of Jove. Alcmenes feared the wrath of Juno, so she left him in a field to die. Juno was tricked into nursing him, causing the Milky Way when he pinched her, and in revenge she sent the serpents. Hercules grew up in Thebes, a city conquered and disarmed by King Arginus of the Minions. When the Minions demanded taxes and tribute, Hercules brutally maimed them and sent them home empty-handed. When King Arginus demanded that he be turned over, Hercules raided the temples for old weapons, revolted, killed King Arginus, and razed the Minion city to the ground. Free of the tyrant, Creon gave him his own daughter Megara in marriage. It seemed like happily ever after, but Juno drove Hercules to madness, and he slew his own children. Next time, we review more early stories of the son of Amphitrio. The Birth of Hercules, a legendary passage from Diodor Siculus, Library of History, translated by George Booth Esquire. We shall now bend our discourse to the things done by Hercules. I am not ignorant that those that write of the actions of the ancients, especially the acts of Hercules, meet with many difficulties. For of all the great actions that were ever done in the world, those of Hercules far exceed all that ever have been recorded. A most difficult task, therefore, it is to give such an account of what this hero did as may be agreeable to the worth and dignity of his actions, or to frame such a discourse as may equalize the greatness of them, for which he attained to a state of immortality. For inasmuch as such things are ancient and unusual, are judged incredible by most, it's absolutely necessary, though with the diminution of this god's glory, to omit some of his acts, lest by relating all, the whole history be rejected as fabulous. For some unreasonably expect as clear evidence for the things that are ancient, as for those done in our own age, and judge of the greatness of actions, which make them seem incredible, according to the rule of things done in the present time, and judge of the strength of Hercules, according to the weak measure of men's strength now. And so by reason of the greatness and strangeness of the things related, history suffers in its credit and reputation. But in old stories the truth ought not to be searched into critically and punctually. For in the plays and theaters, though we do not believe for certain that there were ever such creatures as centaurs, or creatures of a double nature of several species, nor such a one as Geryon that had three bodies, yet we favorably receive and entertain those fables, and with great applause advance the honor of the god. How unjust is it then that men should forget the labors of Hercules while he was here upon earth, whereby he did good to all the world, and instead of rendering him his due praises, to culminate him, our ancestors with unanimous consent for his eminent virtue, honored with divine honors. And what can be more impious than not to preserve and defend the religious respect to this god, which they by their example have recommended to us? But letting these things pass, we shall relate things done by him from the beginning, according as the poets and the most ancient mythologists have handed them down to us. Perseus, they say, was the son of Jupiter by Danae, the daughter of Acrisius, and that Perseus begat Electrio of Andromeda, the daughter of Cepheus, and that Electrio begat Alcmenes of Eurydice, the daughter of Pelops that Jupiter, deceiving Alcmene, lay with her and begat Hercules, so that by this genealogy Hercules descended from the chiefest of the gods, 
both immediately by his mother and more remotely by his great-grandfather Perseus. His virtue and valor were not only evident from his acts, but may be concluded and foreseen by what happened before he was born. For when Jupiter lay with Alcmenes, he lengthened the night threefold, so that spending so much time in procreating this child was a sign how extraordinarily strong he was like to be. They say that Jupiter lay not with her out of any amorous pang of love, as with other women, but merely for procreation's sake, and therefore willing that his embraces at this time should be lawful, he forbore all violence, and knowing that the woman's chastity was such that no arguments would prevail with her, he deceived her by taking upon him the shape of Amphitryo. And now the time of her delivery drew nigh, when Jupiter, full of thoughts concerning the birth of Hercules, in the presence of all the gods, declared that he would make him king of the Persians, who was to be born that day. Whereupon Juno, enraged with jealousy, with the assistance of Elethea, her daughter, gave a check to the delivery of Alcmenes, and brought forth Eurystheus before his full time. But though Jupiter was thus outwitted by Juno, yet that he might perform his promise, he took care to preserve the honor and reputation of Hercules. And therefore it is reported that he prevailed with Juno to consent that Eurystheus being made king according to his promise, Hercules, who should be subject to him, performing twelve labors such as Eurystheus would impose upon him, should be taken into the society of the immortal gods. Alcmenes being delivered, out of fear of Juno's jealousy, exposed the child in a place which is now from him called Hercules' field, about which time Minerva, together with Juno, walking abroad, found the infant, and much admiring his beauty, Minerva persuaded Juno to give it suck, the child drawing the breast with more violence than at his age was usual. Juno, not able to endure the pain, cast away the infant, whom Minerva took up, and brought home to his mother to be nursed by her. The accident here seems very strange and remarkable. For the mother, who owed a natural affection to her own child, exposed him to destruction, but she who hated him as a stepmother unknowingly preserved her natural enemy. Afterwards, Juno sent two serpents to devour the child, but he took them with both his hands by their throats and strangled them. Upon which account the Argives, coming to understand what was done, called him Hercules, because Juno was the occasion of his glory and fame, for he was before called Alcaeus. Others are named by their parents, but he gained his name by his valor. And after times it happened that Amphitryo, being banished from Tyrinth, settled himself in Thebes. Here Hercules was educated. Here he was instructed and greatly improved in all laudable exercises, insomuch as he excelled all others in strength of body, and also in the excellent endowments of his mind. Being now grown to man's estate, he first freed Thebes from tyrannical slavery, and thereby made a grateful return to the country where he was bred. The Thebans at that time were under the tyranny of Herginus, king of the Minions, who every year exacted tribute from them, not without scorn and contempt. Hercules, therefore, not at all discouraged with the greatness of the bondage they labored under, attempted a glorious piece of service. For when those who were sent from Menier to collect the tribute carried it insolently toward the people, he cut off their ears and cast them out of the city, whereupon Erginus demanded the delivery up of the malefactor, and Creon, the prince of Thebes, dreading the potency of Erginus, resolved to deliver him up. But Hercules stirred up the young men of the city to arm themselves, in order to recover the liberty of their country, and to that end took away all the arms that were in the temples, formerly dedicated to the gods by their ancestors, of the spoils of their enemies. For none of the citizens had any arms of their own, by reason the Minions had disarmed the city, so that the Thebans had not the least thought of a revolt. Intelligence being brought up that Erginus with an army approached the city, Hercules set upon him in a straight passage, where a multitude was of little use, and killed Erginus, and cut off almost his whole army. He fell likewise suddenly upon the city of the Orchomenians, entering unexpectedly, and burnt the palace of the Menier and raised the city to the ground. 
The fame of this notable exploit was presently noised all over Greece, while such a sudden and unexpected achievement was the subject of every man's admiration, and Creon the king, wonderfully taken with the valor of the young man, gave him his daughter Megara to wife, and committed to him the care and charge of the city, as if he had been his own son. But Eurystheus, king of Argos, jealous of Hercules, his growing greatness, sent for him to perform the labors he was to impose upon him, which he refusing, Jupiter commanded him to obey King Eurystheus. Whereupon Hercules went to Delphos, and inquired of the oracle concerning this matter, who answered to him that it was the pleasure of the gods that he should perform twelve labors at the command of Eurystheus, and that when he had finished them, he should receive the reward of immortality. Hereupon Hercules became exceedingly sad and melancholy, for he judged it very much below him to be at the beck of his inferior, and to disobey his father Jupiter a second time he concluded was both unprofitable and impossible. While he was in this perplexity, Juno struck him with madness, and being therefore through the discomposure of his mind, became distracted, and by the growth of his distemper, altogether a mad man, he designed to murder Aeolus, who, saving himself by flight, he fell upon his own children by Megara, who were next in his way, and struck them through with his darts, as if they had been his enemies. As soon as he had come again to himself, and understood his error, he almost sunk under the weight of his misery, being pitied by everybody, and shut himself up in his own house a long time, in the converse and society men.